So thank you very much indeed for joining us this afternoon for our first in the Nano in Business series of webinars. And we're looking today at the commercial production of nanomaterials themselves. So we have a really interesting lineup uh, to introduce to you today. But before I get started on that, I want to just give you a little introduction to why we set up this webinar series. The Nanotechnology Industries Association not only represents individual organizations and helps them, supports them in their development activities, but we also have the mission to promote nanotechnology and its ability to make an excellent impact for consumers, the environment, and help support uh, economic development. And as part of that, we've set up two new webinar series, one called Nano in Action and one called Nano in Business. The Nano in Action webinar looks very much at you know, the interesting new breakthroughs that nanotechnology is helping to support, while Nano in Business is really looking at the commercial drivers behind the successful commercialization of nanomaterials and nanotechnologies. So a really small background to that is, as all of you will know, nanotechnology within Europe, at least, is considered a key enabling technology. So an important technology across many different sectors. And the European Union has spent hundreds of millions of euros supporting this. I'm just popping a few people on mute there. That's right. So the European Union has spent hundreds of millions of euros enabling the science behind nanotechnology. So many of you will be aware of not only the, the new nanomaterials projects, but also significant nano safety research. And what we need to do now is really enable the business, because this is where the economic return will come from an enablement of nanotechnology as a science. And as all of you involved in commercial development of technologies and materials, you will know that science is the beginning of the journey. It is not the end. So all great companies start with great science, but great science does not always make a great company. There are many things that will prevent you reaching the market, be a huge variety of things, including even if there is an audience for the great science that you have. So the key things that you look for when you're developing commercial nanotechnology and materials is the line is who is going to pay and what are you going to do to sell it to them? Because you do not have a product until somebody gives you money for it. So many companies set up on a really fantastic product idea or technology idea, but it may never reach the market for many reasons. So successful commercial exploitation of nanomaterials and nanotechnologies requires a number of different factors to take into account. And we're going to cover some of them here today with our presenters. But great examples are a strong regulatory framework because this maps your pathway through to market access and allows you to try and predict the time scale and the cost of bringing a product to commercial accessibility. You have development of very strong standards to enable you to operate worldwide and that so that your data is relevant from beyond your own local market. And of course, who is going to give you the money? What are the business and investment drivers for bringing your great science through to a great product on the market? Because at the end of the day, when you start up your company, investors will invest to make more money back. So how are they going to make that money and when are they going to make their money? These are all questions that organizations ask themselves when they go down the commercial route for development. So we developed up the Nano in Business um, set of webinars to start looking at that. And today we're looking at commercial nanomaterial production. And in the next webinar, we will look at service provision within nanotechnology and nanomaterials, as that is a key part of enabling successful economic product development. So, our agenda today, we have two speakers from NIA member companies. We will kickstart with Landon Mertz from Syrian within the US, and then we will move across to Martin Kemp from VS Particles based in the Netherlands. Very different companies, but both treading the same pathway towards economic return. We will wrap up the presentations then with, uh, pres with uh, David Carlander, our Director of Regulatory Affairs, who will take a look at the regular envir regulatory environment for nanomaterials within the US and the EU, because these will really shape a lot of the business decisions that you will make as you develop your material. At the end of those three presentations, we will move forward to a closed discussion session for NIA members, 
and we aim to end at around sort of quarter past four this afternoon, European time. But we are recording this, so we will make the public elements of the, of the recording available on YouTube and send you the link. And we will also share the slides with members. And as I've already mentioned, we're keeping everybody on mute so that the recording quality remains high. So please do not be offended if you suddenly find yourself muted in the middle of the webinar. So before we moved on to our ad advertised feature, there is, of course, no such thing as a free lunch. So I'm going to give you a two minute overview of the Nanotechnology Industries Association. Many of you will have heard this before, but uh, as the name suggests, we are a non-profit industries organization and we really represent nanotechnology and nanomaterial producers from all around the world. And our core mission is three things. We aim to build a robust regulatory framework, both for core materials and their applications into different sectors so that you can do business with certainty. We look at business and scientific networking for all of our members, which is another reason why we have the webinar today. So you can hear about two of our excellent members. And finally, we work very hard to help build the wider ecosystem for nanotech and nanomaterials. So we work closely with governments, the European Commission, to build a very solid foundation upon which commercial development of materials can take place. This is a tiny snapshot of our some of our companies, and you can see they're very broad. It's at, in, and in fact, it's not just companies that we have as members. We go right from the large inter, international players such as 3R, 3R, BSF, and Solvay, through to startup companies that sort of emerged in the last six months that are looking for support to develop up their pathway to market. We have a number of specialist service providers who, as I said before, are super critical in helping a company successfully bring a product to market. We have an increasing number of expert research organizations, both universities and research uh, centers across Europe primarily, and they bring the latest in safety and uh, nano assessment technologies, which is vital for successful development of materials. And finally, we represent associations from around the world that also support their nano actors. So we're really delighted to have a diverse community of people for who we bring together on a regular basis. So what do we do within our key areas? On the regulatory side, we really look at global cross-sectoral regulatory support. And for our large members, many of them don't need our help directly, but for our small members, we are very much a sort of an external resource for them to use to help them understand the regulatory pathways before them. So we support members directly, but we also work with governments at all levels to try and help build very solid and industry workable regulatory frameworks. And that's very relevant for nanomaterials right now, as they are becoming more specifically referenced in different regulatory frameworks worldwide. Through our business and scientific networking, we have lots of different activities. So our Nanotech Innovation Council right now is working with members to identify the most disruptive technologies that are enabling their businesses right now, so we can draw attention to those. We collaborate with industrial associations across the spectrum, and being based in Brussels, it opens, up, opens us up to the largest number of industrial associations anywhere in the world. Money is always a very exciting topic for members also. So we run a funding tracker to keep an eye on latest funding opportunities and to help our members make the most of those, be they public or private sources of funding. Um, and finally, we're part of a number of international projects that help build the wider ecosystem for nano, as I mentioned earlier. And the latest of those is the project Gov for Nano, which is looking at building risk governance frameworks and a risk governance council to help support confidence throughout the nanotechnology value chain. So what we got coming up beyond today is we have our next webinars are coming up in March and February, and we've got we're looking at nas national associations. We also have our next Nano in Action webinar on composites, and we will be setting the date for that as soon as possible, and we will let you all know. We also have a number of face-to-face -face meetings, the next of which is our eighth annual symposium on March the 27th in Brussels. We would be delighted to see you there as we look at all aspects of 
nanotechnology in business development. And in June, we are extremely pleased to launch our Nano Pavilion for the first time, which is a large conference stand that we can bring to showcase members and nanotech at large international um, events. And the first event we have chosen is Chemspec in June, and a number of our members will be joining us on the Nano Pavilion. So we would strongly advise if you're planning to attend Chemspec, come and find us and we'll have a little nano party there. So, of course, you should be a member to take part of this. And we would be delighted to welcome all different types of organisations, both, as I said before, small startups around nano in any aspect of nano, expert service providers, research centres. You all form part of a very important family. So to do this, you can talk to me directly. Don't forget to sign up for our newsletter and follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter so that you can join the conversation that we have all the time with our members and the wider world. So sales pitch over. I leave you with a delightful reminder of our symposium at the end of March. And now I am going to hand over to our first speaker of the afternoon, who is Landon Mertz. So I'm going to unmute Landon so that he can say hello. And then I am going to hand over the slides to him. So introduce yourself, Landon, while I hand over to you on screen. Yes, absolutely. So uh, thank you, Claire. Uh, just by way of brief introdu introduction, I'm Landon Mertz. I am the CEO of Sirion Advanced Materials here in the United States. We're uh, based in Rochester. Uh, my history with the company briefly is that I joined uh, 10 years ago as the firm's CFO. And then in the last seven years, I've been uh, running the business as the, the firm's CEO. Uh, my personal background has been primarily in taking um, either ideas, startups, or early stage uh, businesses and growing them to successful exit. Um, Sirion today, while it started as a very small shop, I believe about 12 years ago, we're now a fully fledged, fully commercial, uh, profitable business. And uh, just as a quick preamble, uh, my agenda for today really is to cover uh, two broad topics. Uh, the first is I uh, wanted to give everybody an overview of Sirion, what we do, why we do it, and who we do it for, and then really discuss commercialization through two lenses, uh, the first being commercialization as a process, and then the second being some of the key drivers of commercialization. Um, due to key time constraints today, uh, we're going to keep things at a, at a high level, but uh, Everybody will have access to me should they desire. I've left my contact information at the back of the presentation. And if you want to continue the discussion, by all means, please feel free to reach out. So now with that said, uh, we'll move on to the first slide. Uh, overview of Sirion. We've become an industry leader here in North America around the science of designing, scaling, and manufacturing nanomaterials. We do this as a service, um, and we do this mostly for industrial companies and um, uh, the, the defense space. Uh, we were founded in 2007 uh, up here in Rochester, New York, uh, now comprised of 50 employees, four facilities, our headquarters, a research and development lab, which we're actually expanding by about 5x uh, coming in the next few months, uh, our manufacturing facilities, and then chemical storage. Uh, the history of the company is that we were traditionally focused on metals and metal oxides. Uh, that's uh, definitely what we're best known for. About four years ago, we also started to make a push into um, nano ceramics uh, quite successfully. And now we have additional investments going on to bring new capabilities online in hydro thermal processing, as well as um, new techniques to make nano structured grains, uh, which really is more of a uh, powder market mostly for making solid objects uh, that have very unique properties imparted because of the nanomaterials contained within. And our reason for being is fairly straightforward. When we got our start 11, 12 years ago, um, the cost of developing expertise in nanomaterials was just too expensive and too time consuming for uh, companies to really take seriously. Um, and as a result, it really became a significant barrier to entry for any company that was developing a product or a system uh, where they believed they could use nanotechnology to get some new performance uh, benefit. And so over the course of many years, we basically um, decided to 
provide a service to the market, giving them access uh, to this capability and, and advanced access. And, uh, you know, as a result, over the last 10 years, uh, we've made very significant investments into the business, first through equity in our early years and then uh, cash flow in our later years. Uh, but basically, all of our investments have gone into research development and engineering with the real goal of trying to find ways to very cost effectively design nanomaterials in the labs and then transition them to manufacturing scale, uh, true industrial manufacturing scale, seamlessly, quickly, and where the materials truly are cost effective. Anybody who works in the commercial side of nanomaterials knows that that, that cost is typically a rate limiting factor. Um, part of the core of our approach has been uh, to build things from the ground up uh, this gives us an ability to very precisely control chemical reactions um, and the process conditions around them and gives us some, you know, unparalleled ability to do things like control size. Uh, if you're doing a, an alloy control down to, you know, fractions of a, a percent in terms of uh, composition. Uh, but in our, the three places we're best uh, known for would be for design scale and manufacturing. And we'll cover those very briefly. Uh, first, on the design side, because of the process we use, uh, we have very precise control over not only size attri attributes of nanomaterials, but also non-size attributes. So these are things like size, which we work all the way down to about two nanometers, um, also size distribution. The ones that personally I find uh, very interesting myself and where our customers utilize our skills uh, often is in making homogeneous alloys of uh, two or more materials. I think to date we've demonstrated up to five materials in, in one nanoparticle. Uh, do a lot of doping work, a lot of core shell and also core shell shell uh, work. And uh, if we move to the next slide, you'll see we've also put a lot of time and energy and effort into really being able to provide the media that is desired for integration into a customer system. Uh, so we work in aqueous um, uh, environments, organic environments, and then also uh, custom dispersions. These will typically be um, things that a customer has created, some kind of solvent system. It might be one day an optofluid, another day a very proprietary resin. Uh, we also work in powders, pastes, and then what I also like to call redispersible wet cakes. Uh, basically, this was a uh, process that we came up uh, with a while ago with, that enabled us to remove um, the, the solvent system and just isolate the nanomaterials, be able to ship that without the additional shipping cost, and then uh, redisperse it when it gets to the customer site. Um, our next area where we're very well known for is scale up. Uh, keeping it high level, most of uh, the scaling work we do is somewhere between 1,000 to 10,000 times our lab counterparts. Um, one of our hallmarks is this near perfect translation from the lab to the manufacturing environment. And so the material that you see today in the lab or that you're working with in the lab, uh, you're guaranteed that it will be basically the same thing, whether you need one metric ton a year, 10 metric tons, 100 metric tons a year. Uh, and I'm also, I'm very proud to report that uh, we have a 10 year track record of delivering um, materials to our customers successfully. We've never had a commercialization event um, fail for a customer. And then uh, from a manufacturing perspective today, we're, we're one of the leaders in terms of uh, rated capacity. Our plant on a dry particle basis is about 150 metric tons of production. And we are in the process now of expanding to about 500 metric tons of material production capability. And if we look out seven to 10 years, what we really do expect is that our production capacity will probably be somewhere up between 1,000 and 2,000 metric tons, uh, comprising a very wide uh, variety of materials for our customers. So our business model, it's a uh, very unique to differentiated from most companies in the nanomaterial sector. As most people on this call already know, most companies tend to focus on uh, creating a product that solves a problem leveraging nanomaterials um, in order to get that step change improvement. 
Uh, we're very different. As I mentioned, we provide access to nanomaterial capability, expertise cradled to, to grave, lab to manufacturing. And in that type of arrangement, the way that we work with our customers is that uh, it's a very collaborative environment, a lot of information sharing. We, uh, Our customers are focused on really the end product or system. They're subject matter experts in that area. Uh, they're always seeking to leverage nanomaterials, and they're doing the product research, development, and manufacturing. Uh, from Sirion's side, where, where we fit into this equation is that we are the subject matter experts for nanomaterials. And as I mentioned, we end up supporting usually from research straight through to manufacturing if a customer's product or system is going to transition. And then because of uh, the role that we play, um, we try and keep things very simple. From an intellectual property perspective, um, the first thing that uh, all of our cust customers know is we do not compete with customers, period, and, and subject ever. Um, we do not make products uh, for end use applications or for any kind of industrial vertical. And the way that we keep this so clean is how we divide intellectual property uh, with the customer. On the customer's end, whatever material has been designed by Sterion, ultimately the composition of matter for that material is retained by the customer. And Sterion simply uh, retains its uh, different processes to design and manufacture the nanomaterial. Uh, ultimately, that provides the customers with uh, two options. The first option is they can have the materials manufactured by Sirion in our plant in Rochester, New York. The alternative version is that we will license the IP so that the customer can produce it on their manufacturing site. Often in tandem with this, we also um, will design, install, accredit, and train uh, on a system and, in, and put it into the client manufacturing site. So it's really uh, soup to nuts turnkey. A little bit about our customers and the type of work we do. So uh, first of all, virtually everything that we do today is uh, for some customers stealth product or system. It's very rare that we work on something that we can actually discuss publicly. Uh, the other thing, and I, and I can emphatically say this, is that 100% of our work is custom. It's very rare that uh, material off the shelf that you can buy from either a nanomaterial manufacturer or through a lab scale distributor works as intended in a customer system. There are often times where just small tweaks to the formulation or the design of the particle can have profound effects in terms of the performance expressed by that particle. Uh, in terms of customers, most of our customers are mid and large cap. Uh, they cross cut everything from consumer brands to industrial companies. And by the nature of our work, we end up um, supporting in, in a broad sense, almost 40 different industries over the, the history of our, our company. And the materials that we work in have the potential to be inserted into literally thousands of products. Uh, we also defense, uh, support the defense community. So uh, we support DOD internally in terms of um, designing new materials that they can test prototype and field uh, to the warfighter. And we also uh, ultimately supply and manufacture the defense industrial base. Um, most of the work that uh, we're involved in is mostly on offensive, defensive platforms in the field. And then I, I do think it's worth mentioning, while we are capable of supporting basic research, um, the, the best case for the customer and for Sirion is really to be focused on applied research through manufacturing. Uh, mo most often what this means is that the customer either has a theory about how they would like to leverage nanomaterials, uh, or they, uh, more common, will already have a proof of concept but have no way to get the full performance benefits, um, scale it, or manufacture it. And that brings us just to some of the customer use cases uh, that bring people to our door. Uh, the most common uh, first would be the, the company in question doesn't have advanced expertise in designing, scaling, or manufacturing. Uh, another very uh, common uh, door that people walk through is they've internally developed a material at the customer site, uh, but it needs to be either fixed or redesigned. And, and most typically, that's because they're missing some kind of cre uh, critical feature and attribute. 
Um, a lot of times, whatever they've designed in their labs isn't scalable from a process perspective, or even if it is scalable, it's just simply not cost effective. Uh, another, another very common uh, reason why we work with customers is they have materials which they're having a difficult time integrating into a product, a system, or sometimes even a subcomponent. And then uh, we also have a number of customers that come to us with a formula that does work, is already been debugged, they just don't want to manufacture it, and uh, we will take that, replicate that formulation, scale it up, and then ultimately ship it back. Uh, so those are the commercial considerations. There are also a number of strategic considerations. So for a company who is an SME in a, a final product or system, uh, a lot of times they're more concerned about having surety of delivery, uh, not only in, in terms of being able to get materials in the lab, but also at the prototyping stage and then ultimately when they transition for production. Uh, another reason why a lot of customers work with us is frankly just our, our speed and cost of completion. We have a number of customers uh, who have told us over the years that they've worked on a particular material or set of materials for a number of years without being able to crack the code and get exactly what they needed. Uh, this is really where we shine. The more complex, usually um, it, we're able to, to achieve for the customer. And then uh, a very obvious one, just more business focused, is some businesses just don't want to make non-core investments to develop this expertise. If you're an equipment manufacturer, uh, um, it, it's probably rare that you're gonna find uh, a, material, uh, a material operation inside the company. Okay, so we'll get to commercialization real quick. Um, I thought it would be helpful if we uh, put a definition of commercialization up on the board. Uh, and so you can see here, really, I think everybody knows this, is the process of introducing uh, a new product into the market, taking into account, quite honestly, all of the uh, operational mechanisms required to get commercial success, production, distribution, marketing, sales, customer support. Uh, because of the way that our relationships are arranged with the customer, um, the customer is typically the, the entity that's uh, working to make that final product or system and manufacture it. They're handling all the sales, the marketing, the legal, the regulatory for the final product or system. Uh, Syrian, on the other hand, we are typically designing and manufacturing a nanomaterial, which not in all cases, but in most cases, is a subcomponent of uh, a, a much larger product or system. And so where, where we are focused on in terms of commercialization is during the design process, the scale up process, and ultimately the manufacturing. And uh, again, because of the time constraints, we're gonna keep the rest of this discussion high level, but you know, we're gonna cover process and we're also going to cover some of the key drivers in commercialization. Um, what I present today is just a small microcosm of what's important, but uh, for anybody on the line who's just getting a start being a nanomaterial manufacturer, I, I think it's it's a good starting point uh, for orienting your organization. Uh, so first things first, our view on commercialization, um, because uh, ultimately we need to be able to manufacture for a customer and we don't succeed, and a customer doesn't succeed if we don't get to manufacturing, commercialization is a mindset inside of our organization. Um, it, certainly, it, it's a whole of company approach. Uh, every single person in our organization, for the most part, and, and definitely every department, uh, touches commercialization of a customer program as, as we move through it. Uh, the other interesting thing is, is that we work on commercialization um, literally almost from day one when we start a new customer program. Uh, most of our customer programs come through the door of either a research or, or, or development assignment. And the, the next tenet is commercialization plans are living, breathing documents. So these are routinely reviewed, we iterate them all the time, and uh, we add depth to the commercialization plan as the program progresses. Uh, and it does bring up a commercialization paradox for us. So our customers really demand a high degree of customization. And at the same time, they want the lowest cost and the fastest speed because ultimately, um, whoever gets to the market first typically has a first mover advantage. 
And so how do we do this for a customer in, in making very custom tailor-made materials but not reinventing the wheel, especially from a manufacturing perspective every time? Uh, so our solution and our approach, which has worked very well for us, is there is a high degree of inventiveness in the labs, but it's, it's really built on a very large library and a breadth of expertise of different design approaches and techniques that we've developed over the years uh, in terms of making nanomaterials. Uh, and then in our development and our manufacturing, uh, what we have done is we have a, a wide variety of uh, platform manufacturing systems. These systems are extremely well characterized, have very well defined operating parameters. They're very, very flexible in terms of what they can accommodate. And so it allows the, uh, the researcher to do many things in the lab and, and know that it can be executed in the manufacturing environment. Uh, the other thing that we've done uh, for, I'll call it unique processing requirements, is we have a very large library of both inline and bolt-on um, processing capabilities. This allows us to do things like uh, an ultra filtration or you know, uh, significant removal of contaminants if the customer's product or system requires it. So moving on, a couple of the tenets uh, that we have inside our organization is, is definitely first and foremost design for manufacturing. And our, our macro goal here is pretty simple. We want to know that when a researcher is working in the lab, that they're working on things that are going to be manufacturable and they're going to be cost effective. And there's a few ways that we achieve that. The, the first is all of our researchers uh, receive very in-depth training on our manufacturing plan, its capabilities, its process parameters. Uh, the next is we have our researchers participate in the entire uh, transition from lab to development to manufacturing. This allows them to observe firsthand the decisions they make in the lab and how those play out in the manufacturing environment uh, so that they can continually improve their own process. Uh, we also do quite a bit of work while materials are made in the lab around um, assessing things like raw materials, um, the development process that we might anticipate, our engineering solutions required, how would this fit in the manufacturing environment. And ultimately, these routine assessments, what they do is they allow us to surface early and often um, uh, issues that need to be addressed up front, and that can either result in things like changing a formula or it can mean if there is no other viable path, doing some form of engineering to be able to accommodate in the manufacturing plan. Moving on, uh, stress testing, a big part of our development work. Uh, our goals here are, are fairly straightforward. What we want to do is we want to take that, uh, that lab environment made material and we want to figure out how are we going to translate it um, into the development lab uh, that typically requires a, a number of adaptations and scale-up factors, which we've developed over uh, many years here at Sirion. Uh, another goal in this process is, is literally to break the manufacturing process that, um, uh, that we're working with. And that really allows us to define the operating window or the safe zone. Um, and then another big goal, and, and this happens during this process, is to improve uh, the process overall uh, on the factors usually of time, cost, uh, precision, repeatability, and robustness of the formula itself. And then finally, we also focus at this point on uh, quality control, quality assurance parameters, and we start the process of uh, crediting raw materials. And so the actual the process itself is fairly straightforward. We take uh, materials made in the lab and we replicate them at lab scale in the development. We do our translational work to get it into a development scale production system. And then uh, ultimately what we do is we spend a tremendous amount of time exploring process excursions. And so uh, this is much more than what's listed on this slide, but rate of addition, order of addition, process conditions, utility inputs, intentionally doping um, the formula with contaminants that may be resident in the raw materials to see how that impacts the performance and the nature of the material itself. Uh, also, once we get through that process, we, uh, we start to document all the, the required process parameters and the window of operation. And uh, then we take the materials we produce in development and we accredit them ourselves um, using benchtop testing. And then it goes back to our customer uh, again for accreditation. 
uh, based on the outcomes, uh, it's basically a go, no go. If uh, the formula is found not to be robust, it's returned to research for further improvement. Otherwise, the formulation proceeds forward to, to pilot and industrial scale manufacturing. Um, a, quick, a quick note, I'm not gonna cover pilot and industrial scale manufacturing today, um, uh, simply for time. But what I did want to cover very briefly with everybody is something that we call a techno-economic analysis. It's a very, very powerful tool that we've developed here at Sirion that really allows us to understand not only what's the internal cost of the material, but are we on track to meet the cost requirements for the customer? And going through this exercise, which is you know, half technical, half economic, we're also able to identify potential process uh, related areas uh, or, or raw materials that are adding undue cost uh, to the process. And that this techno economic analysis allows us to feedback that information again early and, and often so that we can intercede and correct any problem that we discover very early on. So the goal of, of the techno economic analysis is to take what we've designed in the lab and through our knowledge of our own systems and characterization of our manufacturing systems, turn that into an economic uh, representation. Uh, typically here, we're looking at the manufacturing process, any kind of direct and indirect costs. And uh, the process always starts after a first successful candidate material is created. It doesn't necessarily have to be the perfect material solution because we often iterate materials with our customers. Uh, but once we know that we're on the right track in terms of um, designing a material, we start that analysis work. And that analysis work, uh, after it started, it continues through the entire life of the program until the, the material is commercialized and being shipped as a commercialized product. Um, the approach to the analysis is very much a Sirion trade secret. It's been developed over many years and iterated over many years. But there are a couple fundamental uh, things that I think are worth talking about at, at a high level. Uh, and on the next slide, what you'll see here is one big part of this is diligencing the raw materials. So we're looking at raw material options, costs, and risks. Uh, some natural questions that come out of this. First of all, are the raw materials commercially viable, uh, available? Um, you would be surprised how many times we have customers who have done their own internal work, working with uh, material coming, let's say, from uh, Alpha Azar, Sigma Aldrich, but it's actually not in, in commercial supply. Uh, another very common one is, uh, are we working with a, a raw material that is really viable? This could be on the basis of cost or logistics. Uh, and I, I'll, just to give you a quick example, we designed a, uh, a material that required a feedstock of an element in acetate form, which due to purity requirements was 3X the spot price. Ultimately, what we found is through this analysis, if we purchased an oxide form of that same material, converted it to acetate, it only added 20% marginal cost uh, above the spot price. And so if you're not looking at, at these kind of, of issues, you may just immediately press yourself out of the market. Uh, another common question, can the industrial base uh, for the raw material actually supply the manufacturing volumes that the customer needs today? But also very importantly, in the future, uh, a lot of our customers on the programs that, that uh, we support start out with very small volumes and ramp to large volumes later. And so uh, you always have to, to, to understand, is there a natural level where you will cap out because of your supply chain and what they can produce? Other things translate into cost handling safety concerns. Risk factors, this is only one of many, but one we typically look at is, is this a material that is only available from a sole source or is there a multi-point supply? Uh, and then, you know, the, the table stakes. Uh, what is this material cost? Where are the price breaks? Uh, can we get forward index pricing, especially if it's a uh, spot price material? And then what we also do is we look at uh, the impacts of a, a wide variety of, I'll, I'll call it logistical uh, matters. Uh, shipping of that raw material, the customs uh, and tariffs, regulatory handling, and how that all layers into the final cost delivered to your, to your dock and put into storage. Um, moving on, we also do a, a, a 
very significant amount of work in uh, diligencing the manufacturing process, uh, much more than is listed here, but obviously things that you naturally need to look at is what's your utility inputs and costs. Um, another thing that we look at quite often based on the formula is, uh, is modification required to the plant or not? Is it something we can easily do through our engineering department? Or is there some new invention required to actually accommodate uh, the design of the nanomaterial? And then ultimately, what's that cost of investment? And when, once we've built it, what does it cost to operate? And then uh, the, the big area of focus for us is always on touch labor. Um, so touch labor or labor in general uh, really has the potential to drive the cost of your material upward. Um, as nanomaterial makers, we would all like to think that we can get uh, significant, um, you know, upcharge on our on our uh, cost of materials uh, to make the material. But if you really want volume adoption, you need to not be assuming you're going to get 2x, 3x your cost basis. You really need to be thinking, you know, what is the customer paying now, and what's for their application, and what can that. Gibbs model. We simulate the final production volume goals for the customer. What does it look at that price? Um, and then ultimately, this no economic analysis, uh, and like most other processes we have here lets us identify the challenges. It informs the design, scale up, engineering, manufacturing um, decisions we make. And we keep iterating that until the very end. And then the last uh, point to note, some call insurance requirements. If you're working in an area like CGMP, that is going to become a much larger expense than perhaps you would like it to. Um, outbound shipping, outbound customs, outbound insurances, uh, things that ultimately the customer pay. Uh, another one definitely is if you need to make capital expenditures, uh, what are they? How are you going to finance it if you're going to finance it? Um, I always like to say the capital expenditures are the dirty word in finance, and, and it really is true. You can make a great product, but if it costs $5 million to build a, you know, a modest-sized manufacturing plant, then it's probably not worth your time, energy, and effort. And by doing this work, you can get to what's my internal rate of return going to be for this particular piece of business, and you can very quickly screen whether this is going to work or not. Uh, and then finally, uh, last two kind of major buckets, um, working capital, everybody forgets about it, but it's very important from a, from a cost perspective. Your account's receivable, your account's payable, and your, uh, your inventory and inventory uh, hold requirements. And then a as necessary financing. And I believe I have reached the maximum time allotted to me today, but uh, if anybody has questions, we love supporting the nanotech community. We love supporting our customers. Uh, feel free to reach out to me by email or LinkedIn. And uh, this is on the last slide here, which will be included in the package that, um, that Clara will be distributing after this meeting. Thanks very much indeed, Landon. Um, it was a fascinating presentation. And for me, this is always the critical thing behind the great science. There looking at the economic mapping of the whole process, there are so many things that are going to derail your route to market that you don't really think about. So the cost surprises are rarely to do with the core science and often to do with many other things that you would not consider near the start of the process. So it's always a fascinating learning experience hearing it from somebody else. So I'd like to say a big thank you to Landon. And now I'm going to change the screen over to Martin who is ready and poised to go, hopefully. Now I've just got to find him on my long list of participants. So do you want to Ah, uh, yes, hello.
up, um, great, Martin. I think we have your screen now. We just need to see your slides. That's great. I can see those. And hopefully, right. I, had a, I had a few um, audio connection problems during the last presentation, so I really hope that it was okay for everybody else. So, but please take it away, Martin, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me correctly now? Yeah, I can hear you very well. Perfect. All right. Uh, thank you, Claire, uh, for handing me the screen, and thank you, Lyman, for your uh, very interesting presentation. Um, my name is Mark Kamp, and I'm working at VS Particle, and I will give you a short introduction today uh, about our business model. Uh, which we consider the whole process from particle to product. So really characterizing a single particle uh, towards the final application uh, and product. Uh, so different to uh, what Syrian is doing, we're not actually sell selling and producing material, but we sell uh, machinery and tools for research and uh, industry to generate these materials. So a short introduction uh, about where we come from. Uh, in 1988, uh, Professor Andreas Smit Ott uh, invented the spark ablation technology, which is the key technology of our uh, uh, equipment. Uh, and after decades of fundamental research, he started VS Particle in 2014, together with one of his PhDs and one of his master students. And they started uh, developing the VSP Generator 1, uh, as we know it right now. In 2017, uh, we launched the final product. Uh, together with three launching customers, uh, and at that point we were with five uh, five people covering the entire management team, uh, and we also received an investment from Invaco Management, and this really enabled us to grow and internationally expand our markets towards America, Europe, and Asia, uh, and where we have an international distributor network now to cover all our sales and operations. Uh, last year we were with 18 FTE. Uh, right now we're already with 20 and we uh, expect some growth this year still. Uh, our roadmap for this year is to launch two new products, which is our S1 size selection module uh, and our P1 printing module, of which I will tell you a little bit more uh, uh, afterwards. <clears throat> and we want to sell at least 20 of our current generators, which is our bread and butter of our portfolio. So the problem, uh, it matches the challenge actually that uh, Lennon already mentioned, uh, is that making nanoparticles and nanostructure material is a challenging, time-consuming process, which is hard to scale. Uh, and we want to provide people the tools to really uh, uh, automate this process and make it easy and accessible for everyone. So we hear a lot from our customers that reproducibility uh, is a huge challenge, and they see a lot of deviation uh, in different batches of material that they create and also uh, they take a lot of time to actually uh, uh, generate the recipes. So what we invented uh, was the particle generator uh, and by using uh, the method of spark ablation, this enables us to make, um, uh, to define, make really well-defined uh, nanostructured materials and nanoparticles in an aerosol uh, by using a built material uh, and the concept of spark ablation. So the materials that we can use, because it's an uh, electrical process, we need conductive materials, but we can use all pure metals. Uh, we can also use alloys, which can be bimetallic or even more uh, combinations. Uh, we can also produce oxides if we in introduce a little bit of oxygen into the gas stream. Uh, and we can also uh, produce semiconductor materials. So we're our customers right now. Uh, on the one hand, we have our researchers. And these are uh, typically material researchers that want to accelerate their research by being able to quickly iterate their research cycles. And on the other hand, we have industrial R&D engineers who are working on the functionalization uh, of these production processes and also integrating them uh, into current production methods. So where are we currently operating most? Uh, we made a market analysis based on the total R&D budget worldwide. Uh, one of the biggest markets is still the US, uh, but we see a huge growth in China uh, the last uh, 10 years, and we expect that to continue. Uh, the rest of the countries are also mostly European, Asian uh, countries 
and the Americas. If we specify that a little bit more, you can see it a bit more clear. Um, something which really is uh, interesting uh, about Europe is that 20% of the total market uh, is Europe right now, uh, of which is al almost 25% is Germany. Um, so most of our European efforts is focused uh, on Western Europe with a large focus on Germany, which I can also show you on this map. So this is where we actually serve people. And we also have uh, distributors in all these uh, different parts of the world because currently we're still uh, quite a small company and to really be able to support our customers, uh, do all the delivery uh, service and maintenance, uh, we need local people to support us. Um, our biggest market for this year will be China, uh, where we have a lot of uh, running projects and a lot of running proposals. If we define that more towards the market, we made this market breakdown, which on the y-axis you can see the attractiveness uh, of the market. On the x-axis you can see the match with our core capabilities of the technology. And the size of the bullet uh, actually indicates the, the, the size of the market. <clears throat> and we, we selected these three markets to focus on uh, for the next year which is microelectronics, catalysis, and sensors, because we see the strongest match with our portfolio right now, which I'll explain a little bit more. Um, so if we look at our revenue streams uh, from our products, we have the particle source, which is really the bread and butter uh, for all our customers. So typically uh, a customer buys one of these generators, he buys uh, at the electrodes, which you can see in the middle, uh, which is a consumable. So we expect more revenue from that when we get more systems in the field and people are um, expanding their research and, and focus a little bit. And then there's the functionalization because um, the output of the generator is an aerosol. So the, the particles are suspended in a gas. Uh, and we need a way to functionalize them. So we provide three uh, modules for that right now. Uh, on top, you can see the size selection module. And in the middle, you can see the printing module. And the last one is our standard sample preparation. Our uh, last year has mostly been on the G1 itself. And for this year, we want to work more towards the functionalization. On the other hand, we also have um, contract research, but typically uh, there is a break-even point for our customers. If they make a lot of samples uh, and a lot of, uh, want to iterate a lot of different material compositions, uh, there's a payoff in actually buying the equipment, but we also have customers um, mostly industrial who are more interested in doing contract research because we have a lot of expertise on the process and it speeds up the entire cycle for them. And I want to go uh, roughly over three use cases. So on the left-hand side, you see uh, a, typical, um, a typical setup which a customer buys. So it contains a generator. It called, contains one or more pair of electrodes uh, and a sample preparation holder. Um, we mostly see this in universities and knowledge institutes, which enables them to make a lot of different samples which you can see some examples um, on the top of the slide. Uh, and the biggest advantage for them is where you can really reduce the preparation time. All these samples are typically, typically produced within 10 minutes to up to a few hours <clears throat> uh, compared to weeks or months that they're, uh, that they're used to right now. So there's a lot of value there in terms of research time uh, and PhD capability. Then again, um, it enables them to use all kinds of different materials and it's very easy to use. So it is also a tool which can be used uh, at a lower level of education. Even bachelor students can already start producing their own nanoparticles and investigating them instead of really figuring out all the way uh, how the synthesis method works. So what we see as the biggest potential market here uh, is fundamental materials research. Then uh, I get to the size selection module that we are building right now. 
Um, so again, this is the uh, generator with a pair of electrodes. And then in line, uh, there is a size selection module, which enables to select uh, a model disperse a material from the gas flow. And we can make, as you can see above, it's a TEM image of model dispersed gold particles on the TEM grid. Uh, and it really enables us, us and our customers to investigate the unique specifications of this specific size. So a great example here is a catalyst converter in your car. Uh, typically there's three to seven grams of palladium, platinum and or rhodium uh, in these uh, catalyst converters. Um, but it has been established that only very few of the particles which are deposited into the monolith are actually available for the catalytic, catalytic conversion. So if you can really pin down the exact size and composition of the particle that is uh, responsible uh, for the catalytic conversion of the emission, we can um, enormously reduce the amount of platinum palladium that is necessary to make these parts, uh, which is economically viable, but also from an environmental perspective. One of the other products that we are launching this year is the printer, the printer one. Um, again, uh, it's a generator combined with a pair of electrodes and a printing stage. And we can use the aerosol uh, as the source of material to print. Uh, on top of the screen, you can see an example that we made last year. We printed a circuit on a contact lens. And one of the main uh, advantages of this technology is that it doesn't damage the substrate because it's a very delicate met uh, method compared to conventional printing methods. And here we see a strong match with both universities, but also industrial R&D. And the biggest applications that we see here are gas sensors and printed electronics. I would like to expand a bit on the whole business case for the gas sensors. So if we look at the gas sensor market, we see an exp almost exponential increase uh, in the total market uh, volume towards 2021. And we expect this to grow further afterwards. Um, and on the right hand side, you can see the size reduction uh, and energy consumption reduction of these devices. So right now, a gas sensor is basically a, a MEMS device with a, a, a porous metal oxide layer, which is sensitive for the gas molecules. Um, and if there's a certain threshold in terms of power consumption and production costs for these sensors, where it becomes economically viable to put them in consumer electronics. Um, and if we can enable that, that switch, we, there's really going to be a big boom in the uh, gas sensor consumer market. What is our um, unique production advantage there? If you look at the current production of gas sensors, uh, there is a waiver, which is uh, where it, the layer is drop casted with a pipette and then it put into the oven uh, to vaporize the, <coughs> the ligand um, and then the sensor has to be calibrated piece by piece by hand to actually enable it to work uh, and there are two major challenges in that the one the high cost of the sensors and on the other hand the the very broad range of uh, resistivity of the material so we've actually seen this with our own eyes, uh, where there are hundreds of Chinese ladies doing all this pipetting uh, and uh, calibration steps. And if we can really, um, which what we can do with our printer is we can just put a wafer in the printer and we can deposit all these dots on the specific MEMS devices. And we can make a thousand, thousands of wafers in one go. So there's a lot of industrial potential in that field. So this is our current product portfolio, um, which is really focused on institutes, universities uh, and industrial R&D. And if we find the right trigger uh, in the right market, we're going to develop the next step in our product. So the second generation of systems, uh, which is really going to be an integrated version uh, of all these components, uh, allowing uh, scalability of production 
but also um, um, higher accuracy and higher reliability. And in the end, our dream goal is to uh, create a strong bridge between research and industry, where our data from the R&D part of our machinery can really be directly integrated into an industrial process uh, by direct feedback through data. That's the ultimate goal of, uh, of finding all these material properties. All right, um, thank you very much for listening. Um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to contact me uh, through my email. To look at our website if you're interested. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks if you have any questions. Martin. That's really, really helpful. And obviously we have here a very different company to Sarian. It's younger, it's smaller. It's looking at what potential market applications it has for its technologies. So it's very interesting for me to understand you know, how you decide to go into those kind of markets and how quickly you have to travel to be able to meet the market, you know, to fill that market niche first, because it is uber competitive. And there is no doubt that, you know, once Chinese production companies become able to do that, they will do it at a, at a huge rate. So it's always a really good challenge, particularly for European companies to move quickly to fill a market gap and become established. But that's something we'll be discussing with members after the, web, the main webinar finishes. But now I would very much like to take the screen back. Hang on, I'm going to change presenter to me. There we go. And I am going to open the last presentation that we have for the afternoon, which is from David Carlander, our Director of Regulatory Affairs, who is just going to look at the regulatory pathways that materials producers have to follow. And this is a broad look at it and goes alongside both what Martin and uh, Landon said about preparing and mapping your route to market. So, David, do you want to say hi and introduce yourself? Uh, hello, everybody. Indeed, this is David Carlander with the NIA, and I'll hope for the next 10-ish uh, minutes uh, give a somewhat a broad uh, overview of some of the issues related to the regulatory environments. But obviously, as I'm sure you can also understand, a 10-minute presentation on nano regulations will only be able to cover the um, the top and scratch the surface. But I will mention some of the main issues and obviously uh, a lot of more details uh, can of course be provided to, uh, well, we are providing that to, to our members and, and uh, can be found elsewhere. So the next slide, please, Claire, as I think you are running my slide. So thank you very much. Um, this is just to just outline very briefly a number of the issues especially relevant for a small starter or an SME when you are considering all the issues related to putting your product onto the market. You need your regulatory strategy to have been fully developed because there are so many issues to consider. Um, you need to understand under what jurisdiction and framework or regulatory framework your material, your product falls under. Um, in Europe, we of course you have heard of the REACH regulation, and I'll come back to that one. But also in the in the US, you have EPA, um, the, the 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 TASCA regulation, the TASCA Act. But of course, depending on what sector you're in, if it's cosmetics, food, farm, environment, electronics, etc., there are a number of of specific uh, regulatory frameworks that have to be considered. Um, are you the producer of the substance or are you using a substance to create a mixture or are you using it more of a downstream user creating a, a product or an article? Um, and of course, those are the, uh, the fundamental issues, but you also need to consider your um, occupational setting for your workers, for your employees. Uh, are there issues that's related to transport, transboundary movement of hazardous waste, for example, and also, of course, end of life and what is also politically now um, and, and, of course, also for an environment purposes, the, the, the end of life and the circular economy issues related to that. But, of course, there is a broad, a very broad and detailed um, knowledge out there, but to some extent, especially for smaller enterprise or startups, there's a huge amount of information in regulations, what regulations are looking 
looking at the whole issue of standards, looking at ISO standards, that you have to fulfill criteria or product specifications uh, to for, for business to business um, sales, or there are guidelines related to regulations or guidance, re guidance related to regulations, as well as how to perform your um, health and safety testing, uh, your toxicity testing on, on for endpoints that are required to to uh, create your regulatory dossier where that is required. So one of the early issues you have to discuss is, of course, or take a decision on in-house is, will we do this by, by in-house expertise or will we go to outside service providers um, to be able to manage these, these uh, dossiers, to get help with assess all the information and to some extent where we currently are, if you're um, already have some knowledge about this process, especially from uh, the regulatory side, there are still some um, gray areas on, on how to manage and look at uh, dossiers on nanomaterials when it comes to what endpoints and what methods to use to create uh, information for those specific endpoints. So for that reason, it's of course very important to also engage and provide get information from, from industry associations such as NIA, as well as regulatory agencies that are present in, 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 in the jurisdiction where you're at and so forth. So this is just like a one-stop short little slide of all the aspects that should be considered. So moving over to the next slide, please. Where in Europe, starting out in Europe, you may or may not be aware that just uh, recently in December last year, um, there was a uh, publication uh, or regulation published that adopted uh, a number of nanospecific issues on the REACH regulation. So the REACH is the overarching chemicals regulation in Europe. And uh, REACH has a number of annexes. So this annexes regulation was was published and it is, is it is to be applicable from the 1st of January 2020, so in less than a year. And on the next slide, it's just a one slide on what the nanospecific modifications are of this REACH annexes regulation. First of all, it's a general clarification that indeed nanoforms, nanomaterials are covered by the REACH regulation. So if you're providing a registration dossier, the nanoforms must be addressed, assessed, and the conclusions uh, from, from these nanoforms must be documented, as well as if there are specific risk management measures that have to be performed. They also have to be identified and provided to the, in this case, the European Chemicals Agency in Helsinki, Finland. Um, the regulation also provides for a definition of a nanoform as well as a set of similar nanoforms. And I think it's really very important to understand that in Europe, if you're working with raw materials or substances, um, chemicals, there is now a regulatory definition of what is a nanoform. And it's based on the European Commission recommendation that was published in 2011. Uh, the regulation also provides a number of um, characterization um, aspects for nanoforms issues that you have to provide to be able to uh, to show that you have characterized your nanoform. And there's the introduction of requirements depending on your tonnage. Um, as you may recall, REACH is applicable for substances we just produce in more than one ton per year. And up to, depending on the threshold, if it's 10, 100 or 1,000, uh, tons per year, you have different requirements on the information that you need to be provided. And this is also outlined in this regulation. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, just popping over to the US and also just touching on some of the examples there, again, on the issue of time. Uh, we're not going too much detail, but we're going to start on the next slide with the United States Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, which uh, are in charge of a number of, of, of regulation or statutes, um, regulatory acts uh, on the US, and especially what's highlighted here in bold, the first one, the Toxic Substance Control Act, which will be the focus of the next few slides. But also recall that EPA has the, the Federal Insecticide Fungicide and Rodenticide Act, where also a number of nanomaterial 
issues or, or substances can be can be applied. So next slide, please. Um, so the main um, um, act for, for registration of chemical substances in the US is the Toxic Substances Control Act or the, the TASCA Act. And that was, you may have recalled if you followed this, it was amended in 2016. Um, and TASCA in general has a number of parts or sections that governs the listing, risk assessment, and reporting of existing as well as new substances producing volumes over 10,000 kilos, so 10 tons per year. So it's 10 times more than the, the minimum threshold for used by the European Chemicals Agency. So you have these new substances. Uh, if you produce a new substance, you have to register it by submission of a pre-manufacturing notice, a PMN. Next slide, please. Um, so what the uh, TASCA the, um, allows for is, first of all, uh, all chemical substances are required to be listed in the TASCA inventory, which currently holds about 83,000 um, chemical substances. So. For your nanomaterial, the nanoscale version of an existing substance, you need to determine if it's a new or if it's a new substance or if it is indeed a nanoscale version of an already existing substance. So if, it, if you would consider that your, uh, if it's, if your nanoscale is regarded as an existing substance, the EPA may, may issue what is referred to as a significant new use notification where additional chemical and toxic information is required. And EPA has, has issued a number of those scenarios, especially for carbon nanotubes. Or if it is a new substance, this pre notice has to be um, provided, and that is a, basically a dossier containing information on the chemical identity, its properties, uh, occupation, exposure information, as well as summarizing toxicity, environmental release, and so forth for this uh, new substance falling under the PMN. Next slide, please. Um, so what has happened is that in one of the section of the task count, the section 8A, uh, there's a specific rule um, related to chemical substances manufactured processed as nanoscale materials. And the reason for, for this rule, uh, of the Section 8A rule, is to ensure that EPA has indeed basic information on nanoscale materials currently on the marketplace. And um, so what happened is that um, this rule will provide EPA with information uh, and uh, to allow EPA to take a, a possibly a future decision if more uh, uh, if, if further actions should be should be provided, so this rule came into effect last in 2017 on the 14th of August and provides for and it's a it's a one-time rule, um, and it uh, goes back through so products that's been on the market for the last three years should provide this information. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this is yeah, sorry. This is the the, the one-time reporting scheme, um, uh, but they also have for the uh, the new the, the new substances. There's a 135-day pre-manufacturing notification requirement uh, before you can start the production of the substance if it is a new one. Uh, but there's also, of course, a number of exemptions because the this rule does not apply to chemical substances. Uh, in forms that contain less than one percent by weight of particles, including aggregates and agglomerates, in the size range of one to hundred nanometers. Also interesting here is that um, the, the, the or to mention is that the EPA has a rather fluid um, understanding, uh, not as detailed specific as the definition in, in Europe, um, but it's talking about. Uh, materials in the scale 1 to 100 nanometers. Next slide, please. So this is what is uh, required by the, the, the EPA uh, when you're providing the information to the EPA. They only require information that is known to or reasonably ascertained by person subject to the rule. So this means that it's 
there does not require um, new development or generation of new data or minimum set of data. But what they expect is information on this number of, of points listed there, such as the specific chemical identity, the material characterization, production volume, it used uh, manufacturing and, and methods, etc. This is what EPA would expect to be submitted. Um, moving over, so next slide, just touching a bit on. Uh, oh, sorry, this is a, this is actually the, the 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 final rule of the of the EPA. Uh, next slide uh, will be where we move over to the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, where you may be aware, of course, that the general competence of FDA is covering a broad range of products. Um, and a number of them are subjected to a pre-market authorization, and that includes drugs and biological products, devices, and food and color additives. But there are also a number of FDA-regulated products that are not subject to pre-market authorization. For example, dietary supplements, cosmetics, and food ingredients that are generally recognized as safe. However, in all cases, all FDA-regulated products cannot be marketed unless they satisfy specific statutory requirements for safety and efficacy. So this is not nano-specific. But the next slide, I'll just touch upon uh, one example, um, and that is that uh, FDA um, competence of medicines. So for products on the market, if you would introduce a nanoscale ingredient uh, that would trigger um, so it would, you, it would actually change your product. That, or that would trigger a, a change notification chemistry. You would have to submit that to FDA for them to permit and review that and approve the revised formulation. Um, but if you have a, a um, for the pre-market approval, so basically for, for new developments, new pharmaceuticals, uh, a dossier will need to be submitted to the Central Drug Evaluation and uh, they will do a um, chemistry effect control review to look at the document that has been provided. And for the FDA, uh, they are considering basically there's not a specific nano material definition, uh, but it's also a bit broader than generally uh, considered uh, being nano. So they consider nano materials which have at least one dimension smaller than 100,000 uh, nanometers. So, so uh, basically below one micrometer. The next slide, please, uh, which is the last one, which is just uh, another example of the FDA when looking at food additives. And this is for post-market action. So if a new version of the substance would be marketed uh, under food additive regulation and it raises safety concerns. Uh, so this is in, within the remit of the FDA. I'm going to give the example, due to the addition of nanoscale materials, the FDA can issue a call for data on the safety of such a version of the substance. And they can then publish a proposed rule to amend the food additive regulation to address under the circumstances the nanoscale version of the substance may be safely used. So the next slide, please where you will realize that this was indeed a very, very short, uh, just to give some um, points where, where regulations exist, but obviously there are a number of other um, regulatory areas that are covered, both the EU and the US. And within IA, we had, for example, our regulatory monitoring database, where we um, globally cover regulations that are applicable to non-materials, not only in, in Europe and US, but, uh, but on a global level. And we have also, as Claire mentioned previously, our uh, global regulatory working group acting in this area as well. So again, just do not hesitate to get in contact with us, and I will end my presentation right here. Thank you very much. Thanks very much indeed, David. That was, it certainly made sort of an, an hour and 20 minutes of very intense uh, information sharing. So we will send everybody the follow-up test on this tomorrow, whereby we are expecting 100% correct answers from everybody who came today.
So I'm going to wrap up the public side of the webinar now and say a huge thank you to all of our presenters this afternoon. They all put a lot of effort into their presentations. And I hope very much that this was a useful insight into the commercial and strategic decision making behind nanomaterials production. Now, as I said at the beginning, it's super interesting because once you have the great science in place, you have to make sure that it also makes a great business. And that does not happen in the majority of the cases. So we will wrap this up by sending everybody the link to the recording of this uh, with YouTube and a follow up email with this for particularly for the registration links for future activities such as the Nano in Action and other webinars that we will have coming up. So I say thanks very much. We hope you enjoyed it. Any feedback on this is always very welcome and you can contact us either on the email that David has left there or on my email at the beginning of my slides. So I'm going to switch off the recording, kick out all the non-members and switch to the member only side of the discussion. Thank you very much indeed, everybody.